Well, hello, everyone. My name is Austin. This is Gospel Simplicity, and I am so glad that you chose to click on this video today. Hey, I'll let you get to the interview in just a second. But first, I wanted to say a big thank you to my patron subscribers and merch buyers who make this channel possible. Without your generosity, we wouldn't be able to do interviews like this. A big thank you especially to my patrons who through their monthly giving allow this channel not only to be sustainable, but to uh, expand into exciting and new things. Because of them, the podcast exists. Because of them, I'm able to do these interviews, these church tours. So thank you so much to them. If you're interested in supporting this ministry in that way, if you too believe that the gospel is really good news and you want to get behind this mission of this channel to spread that to people and to engage with different Christian traditions with, with the goal of elucidating the beautiful simplicity and transformative power of the gospel, well then I'd invite you to consider that. Of course, no obligation, but if you feel that God has put that on your heart or you just want to support this in that way, well then I would really appreciate that. Anyway, for now, I hope you enjoy this interview with Father Seraphine because I know I did. All right. Well, hey, everyone. Welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Austin. This is Gospel Simplicity, and I am so glad that you're here today. Today, I have a very special guest with me, Father Seraphim Aldea. Father Seraphim was tonsured as a monk in 2005 in North Moldova. He has a PhD in modern theology, which he would say, who cares about that part? <laughs> and he is, uh, is currently a priest monk, at a Orthodox monastery in the Hebrides, the first Orthodox monastery in the Hebrides in over a millennium. Father Seraphim, thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you for inviting me, Austin. I very, very much appreciate it. Well, I have been so excited to do this. And the first question I wanted to ask is, how did you end up as a monk? I remember listening through an interview with you that you did, and you mentioned that you had originally studied economics, I believe. And I was talking to my dad, actually, right before I started this today. I told him I was interviewing a monk, and he said, oh, you're interviewing a Buddhist. And I said, well, <laughs> not quite. There's actually Christian monks. And he said, huh. Yeah. So could you uh, just tell us a little yeah. bit about how you ended up as a monk? Well, first, there have been Christian monks since like the late 200s. So I'm not quite a, a novelty in, in doing that. And you're right, I studied economics initially, and then I studied literature, and then I studied arts, and then eventually I ended up uh, studying theology and joining the monastery. But um, it is a question I get asked a lot, particularly when I travel to non-Orthodox countries, because I do understand how a monastic can be something of an exotic bird or, you know, that sort of stuff. And most people imagine that you go through some sort of... Uh, the reality, Austin, is that in life you don't have a collection of masks or images and you're looking at them and then you decide which mask you like best and then you apply it onto your face. Uh, I have met people who live their lives that way and they're never very happy. The best way to live your life, if God allows you, to live that way is to recognize in you who you are and then you just become that thing that person that entity but not in the sense of putting on a mask putting a name onto yourself just learning to recognize who you have always been and i remember um you know how everybody goes through those important, all important teenage years questions about life and death, purpose of life and so on. And everybody would say that, you know, you'll grow out of them and so on. I never really wanted to grow out of them because no nothing really seemed equally important to me at that time or since then. And as I grew older and I turned into an adult and I got my job and my girlfriend and, you know, the perspective of a family and everything... Nothing erased those questions from me. Who am I? Where am I going? Why am I here? And uh, is there an eternal version of myself? And so on. And these questions made it impossible for me really to live kind of a normal life, what most people would uh, <laughs> uh, describe as a normal life. So I've learned the minute I have met the first monastics I have met, that that's, that's who I've always been. I just was not aware that I was a monk inside because I wasn't aware monastics existed. I didn't know what on earth they were doing. I knew that they were like people dressed in black who never get married, but that was pretty much the extent of my knowledge. Uh, 
But once I got to speak to one, I simply saw in him who I had been for many years. And you, uh-huh. you, so instead of becoming something, you kind of just recognize who you are. Wow, I, I really appreciate the way that you put that. And I think that's going to be such valuable advice for so many people who are trying to discern what they want to do when they grow up. And they're looking for these external things to now define who they are rather than seeing that it's kind of a, a living into who you were born to be at. Not yeah, to don't get me wrong. Way. I mean, I tried, I tried to understand who I was through external things for uh, quite some time. I mean, again, I've had uh, relationships in the world and I've fallen in love and I loved good things and good clothes and I hope nobody will ever dig out uh, old photographs of me <laughs> and uh, I used to go to clubs and all of that. I mean, I, I did all the, the normal and I think healthy things that a teenager and a young man and woman uh, should be doing because you go through them at that stage and that allows you to kind of burn those stages there will never be a moment for me in my 50s or 60s when I can look back and wonder well what if I had done all of those things I did those things I consumed that version of life and it never extinguished these questions who am I? Deep down, there was always this, you know, big question, who am I and why am I? Wow, that's really powerful. And so I think I can relate to a lot of what you said early on about not really having a great idea of what a monastic life would be like, you know, growing up as a Protestant, as I kind of jokingly mentioned about my dad saying that, but I I had heard of monks and I knew it was in the Christian tradition, but I had never met a monk. In fact, I think you're the first monk I've ever met, Father Seraphim. <laughs> oh, you deserve so much better, Austin. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> not at all. But just for those that are curious, who perhaps come from a background like me, or even perhaps are from a Catholic or Orthodox background, but haven't met a monk before, or don't know much about a monastic tradition, what is just like a day in the life of a monk look like for you at the Mole Monastery? Well... You split your time as balanced as you can, and that balance does change depending on your age and a number of other criteria. But you do spend your time between prayer, personal prayer, and then uh, prayer in the church with the brotherhood or the sisterhood. Then obedience, where obedience simply means helping around the monastery and doing the things that the abbot, the superior, is asking you to do to to help the monastery. And that's also not something uh, devoid of spiritual meaning because a good abbot would always ask you to do the things that are important for you as a person. Like to give you an example, if if he notices that you are, I don't know, fought by pride, he is going to ask you to go and clean the toilets you out of the entire community. Or if he notices that you are, I don't know, fought by gluttony, he's going to ask you to work in the kitchen but forbid you from eating outside, you know, the normal meals. And I mean, he's always going to look for those things in terms of practical things you can do that will help you learn more about what passions fight you and how you can learn to fight back. So you have your prayer time, personal prayer time in your cell and prayer in church. You have these obediences that are always underlined by a spiritual reasoning and which are almost always doubled by saying the Jesus prayer, which is just basically praying quietly at the back of your heart, at the back of your mind. And then you have your personal time when you do more prayer or more reading or walking or whatever kind of rests your your soul. That's really great. And I think... You know, for people out there listening, I imagine there's a beautiful parallel to those of us who aren't monastics that we can see that I love how you talk about that it's not as though you have the spiritual time when you're praying and then you have your work time that's somehow separated from that, but that there is a spiritual depth to the seemingly mundane things as well. For a monastic, it's easier because your entire life is dedicated to Christ and dedicated to you becoming Christ-like. So every single aspect of your life, at least theoretically, should be directed to make that happen. 
in the life of uh, someone in the world with um, you know a spouse and children and responsibilities it takes more effort but the outcome should be the same and it, it and it can be done as you said even being stuck in traffic can become an opportunity opportunity to pray or an opportunity to learn about yourself that you are impatient that you are very quick to judge others and i don't know curse them or say nasty things about them i mean even that although it sounds like a negative thing if you become aware of it you've already grown a bit spiritually because now you know where you're supposed to direct your fighting this this is what i'm supposed to be fighting in myself this need for anger or revenge or something but it takes a bit more planning for a lay person a person in the world yeah i appreciate the way that you put that and it reminds me again i i always try to see what people have said in prior interviews so that i can kind of learn about them and i was watching one that you did and you were talking about prayer and i really wanted to bring this up i i want to talk about prayer a little bit in general but you told a story of I believe it was you used to be on the train and sometimes the windows would fog up and you would put a cross on it. Could you talk a little bit about that and how we can develop a life of prayer just in all things? Well that was that was actually around the time when I knew I already knew that I am supposed to live in a monastery but my spiritual father had not yet blessed me to go into a monastery and I was still a student. I was I think 19 20 21 something Th- those were the the difficult years for me because I was kind of stuck in between two worlds and um and I have very soon learned that praying for others and blessing others brings me more grace than actually focusing on myself mm-hmm. so because I'd learned that and with the blessing again of my spiritual father I had started to almost like I still do it to this day so for instance when I saw you when when this window popped up the first thing I did is I kind of imprinted I sealed a little cross on your forehead just here because I want God to bless you and I want this meeting of ours to be more than just you know two human beings exchanging words so I've learned to do that so as I was walking the streets I would just bless everybody just stamp everybody but then when you travel with something like the tram it was winter and I was going to university on in the trams in Bucharest uh I struggled because it would get foggy so I couldn't see the faces of the people in the streets so I just made a little cross so that whomever I could see as I was on the tram would be automatically blessed by that cross but this is the sort of thing I, I was trying to tell you earlier as a person in the world you have to develop these if you want spiritual games or spiritual attitudes that that's a better word a spiritual attitude in the way in which you encounter the world and you interact with the world because if you don't do that if you're not in control of that then the world will impose its own attitude on you and you are going to become merely a producer of something and a consumer of other things wow that's so well said and i think that that resonates so much with me and that if we're not intentional in this then this doesn't happen automatically that, that we have to work towards this and i will say after watching that interview that where you mentioned that idea of of seeing kind of the cross on people's face i challenged myself that day i was in downtown chicago at the time so there's people everywhere just as i walked around the city to try to see that in people and to say a, a quick prayer for each person i walked past and i'm not going to say i've done that every time since i wish i have but it's such a powerful way of living in the world of seeing mm-hmm. people and, and developing and cultivating kind of a, a more prayerful way of living and i think yeah. as a monastic i mean that that's so much of what it's all about correct that's all i mean that's you, you, your entire energy goes only towards that there's nothing else to consume your energy that's the beauty of the monastic life because there's nothing you, you, there are no deadlines there are no no pressures there are i mean generally there's nothing all of those rest on the shoulders of your abbot he is the one who interacts with the world he's the one who deals with i don't know accountants and the need to fundraise and keep the place going from a financial point of view and all of that you the minute you've entered the monastery your only concern is who you are before christ and how you can bring yourself before him in a more honest way so you can grow more like him wow yeah i imagine that has to be such a difficult job of being an abbot to have one foot in both worlds in that way and to have the care of the monastery that he would have as well as 
the you know care of the individuals and just cultivating his own life of prayer that has to be a a heavy burden but also a great gift in a way god can use anything for our salvation i have met people in confession who were so tormented by a particular um, uh, passion again gluttony or lust lust is very common especially during our generation so but i've seen people who are so tormented by a constant stream of of failing to control this and uh, just innumerable attempts to keep it under control and, and not fall again and again and and although they kept on falling and they felt and perceived themselves as being increasingly more miserable what I saw from the outside was a human being who is increasingly humble and increasingly less ready to judge and condemn others, more willing to help others. Because the, the lower you perceive yourself, the more you want to do other things in order to wash away that sinfulness of yours. So while God was keeping them humble through this particular sin, in fact, underneath it all, they were being turned into something absolutely beautiful. It's like a fire, like a fire that brings out you know, the beauty in, in, in a metal. Yes. I once had a mentor of mine, a pastor, who drew a graph on a whiteboard for me of what the Christian life often feels like. Mm -hmm. And he mentioned that, you know, at conversion, we feel as though, you know, we've cleaned up and we've arrived. And then we go through and we become more progressively aware of our sins. And we realize, oh, like, there's so much sin in me. There's so much that I struggle with. It's like, but in the midst of that struggle, as you're becoming aware of it, that is actually how we're growing as well. And I, I like the way you used fire for that. I think that's a good mm -hmm. way to illustrate that. Well, I wanted to ask a little more about prayer because I don't think I know any Christian that doesn't want to have a more robust prayer life. I think almost every Christian, if I sat down and talked to them, like, you know, how, how's your prayer life going? They'd say, you know, it, it might be on a spectrum, but almost everyone would say, I feel like I could be doing more. I feel like I could be going deeper in prayer. And so would you break down why prayer is so central to the Christian life? And perhaps what is maybe a orthodox perspective on prayer? This channel has people from many Christian traditions and perhaps what, what's unique in the orthodox tradition with it? Ooh. <clears throat> Uh, I mean, again, Austin, this is just me talking about my own experience, and uh, I, I don't want to speak for the Orthodox Church. I'm not in a position to do that. There are m much you know, better people out there who can do that. Uh, prayer, f for me, has always been an attempt to learn who God is by, by meeting Him almost face to face, the way we see each other now. And underneath that, underneath the need to, to see God's face, there's a secondary need, equally important to me, to learn who I am. And I've had this instinct all my life, even before I was a practicing Christian of any kind, that I can only learn who I am by learning who God is. Yeah. Later on, I've learned that this is, in fact, the Christian theology of prayer and of who we are, because we are created in the image of God. So the more I look at God, the more I reinforce in myself that divine image, and I find out who I'm supposed to become. So for me, prayer really is just a portal or a place where I bring myself as honest, as spiritually, emotionally naked, if you want to put it that way, as I possibly can be, where I bring myself before God and I try to I try to just keep myself under his gaze. And I try to allow that gaze to transform me into whom he wants me to be. You know that I I I read this somewhere and um, in one of the of the fathers of the church, when God creates us, he creates us with something in mind. We, he knows our potential. He knows whom we can become. And every time I bring myself in prayer before him, it's like this need to, to get in touch again with my own potential and hopefully to grow a bit more into that potential, if it makes any sense. Um, that makes lots of sense. 
Thank you so I'm much. Very glory be to God. Yeah. I think that that's something that our world in general, and I can relate to myself for sure, is starving for today. We have so much talk about self-awareness, which I think is a, a good desire. I think that we we do want to know ourselves, but I think so often we miss that order that you put out there, that that we know ourselves by knowing God, that as we know God in prayer, we begin to learn more about who we are. And I think that is... We as Christians, um, we as individuals first, not to just preach that to the culture, but when we can really understand that we will have such greater self-awareness rather than just, you know, kind of, uh, as my professors say, staring at our belly buttons to find out who we are, you know, navel gazing, but rather looking to God in prayer. So thank you so much for... The reality that. of it is that whether we like it or not, uh, we are almost like an unfinished business, each of us. We are created in order to become something. We are like mm -hmm. just fetuses, you know, embryos in, in this wonderful womb of the church and of the world. But we are supposed to become something. And even if you are not Christian or if you are not relating to Christ in a way that you would want him to determine who you are, something else will take Christ's place in your life and something else will determine who you become. And it can be your job. I mean, I've met so many people who their self-understanding is simply their profession. That's all they are. And once they retire, they've lost any meaning of life. I've met people for whom their spouse or their children, their family is everything. And that's also an idol because you are so much more as a human being than just somebody's wife or somebody's husband or somebody's child or parent. So unless you, as you were saying, intentionally allow God to be the determining factor in your becoming, something else from the culture around you will step in and replace that role that Christ is supposed to, to have, and you'll become something of this world. Amen. And everything else ultimately will be fleeting. Like you said, all of those things can be taken from us. And there's so much devastation in that. I think we're, we're seeing it's not that. Only, so I mean, that, that is a horrible experience. I've seen that in so many people, but there's something even uh, deeper and more frightening than the fact that you will discover at the end of your life that your profession cannot determine yourself or your family cannot determine your identity and so on. There's always underneath it all that reality that God has created us of nothing and imprinted his divine image on us. We are always caught between this paradox. We are nothing, and we have the potential to become God-like at the same time. So unless we become God-like, everything else, regardless how appreciated it is in the world today, at the moment, everything else is nothing. That's the thing that scared me. If, if, if you don't find who you are, in God, in his image. Any other self-understanding, self-identity is reducible to nothingness. Wow. That's so powerful, that idea of that we are we are people who are becoming and caught in that paradox between nothing and God-likeness. I think that's a lot for people. Perhaps some people just need to pause the video right now and, and think about that for a second. Something I wanted to ask about as well uh, while we're on the topic of prayer, that's unique to the Orthodox tradition, at least for me as a Protestant. I know some Catholics will have this as well. But the the place of icons in prayer, I've had the privilege of, I recently just toured an Orthodox church. I've been, I went to services there for about three or four weeks in a row and have really enjoyed getting to learn about that. But could you speak a little bit about the role that icons play in the life of prayer? Well, icons have been absolutely universal in the first millennium, in what we know as Christendom. You know, there wasn't a Catholic church or an Orthodox church in the first millennium. That happened after the schism, uh, the 11th century. But icons were generally used in uh, worship uh, during the first millennium. There are, again, different stages 
that you can talk about the use of icons in church. The, the lowest one is that icons have been extremely useful, particularly in those early centuries, the first millennium and so on, <clears throat> for people who could not read. We take for granted this society in which everybody almost can read. And also we take for granted the fact that it is so easy, financially even, and practically to just grab a copy of the Gospel. But that was not the case for 17th, 18th century of the existence of the Christian church, the Christian faith. For those people in all those centuries, the way to see the story of Christ and the story of the saints and the story, everything about the stories of the gospel was to see them depicted uh, in icons. That is, to me, the lowest use of icons, but it was a very practical, useful, you know, uh, reason for having them. The deeper meaning of an icon is that when you look at an icon, I am constantly and immediately reminded of that image, the divine image in me. I'm constantly reminded that while I'm looking at an icon painted on wood, that is the image of Christ. I am a much better icon, a much more valuable kind of icon, because I am an icon painted in flesh and blood. Christ has died for this icon to become like him. And even the ways in which we interact with each other, the simple ex uh, examples that we had, like me blessing you with that stamp of the cross or blessing those people you know, from the tram, you interact with people by trying to see in them the divine image of Christ. Otherwise, I mean, you can look at a human being and see the potential... You can see how you can help me financially, for example. I can see how you can help me by introducing me to people who can then help me other ways. I can see how you can help me physically and so on. But I can also look at you, relate to you and interact with you as an icon, as a living, breathing, walking icon, because you are a bearer of Christ's image. If you are alive, if Christ created you and you exist, he made you of nothing, but he did imprint on you that divine image. And it is my duty, and it is my joy, and my it, it's an honor for me to meet you and to meet anyone else, because in them I see, I see another expression of Christ's image into this world. And this is what an icon does as well. It, it, it's a very smooth tran transition for an Orthodox to go outside the church where you are surrounded by the faces of all those who've gone before you and who found their salvation before you, the saints and, and so on. And then you go into the world and you see the saints in their process of becoming, the people in the street and so on. If you've paid attention, you, you said you've been through a service in uh, an Orthodox church, correct? If you've paid attention when the priest begins to sense he begins to sense from the altar, and then he senses the icons, and, and he senses the icons, but also you, everyone in the church. That's why he's doing it, because he's not actually sensing the wood and the paint in that icon, and he's not sensing your clothes or your flesh and your bones. He's sensing that divine image imprinted in you. It's almost like our entire life as Orthodox, all we do is we are out hunting for God. You know, where is the image of God hidden in this person in front of me? How can I see you as an icon? And when I've managed that, then I've, I've, I've received a great gift from Christ. Wow, that's wonderful. And I had never thought of, you know, growing up, the first time I was, well, I didn't even really grow up with icons at all. But then I think the first time that I saw them, I kind of put them alongside other religious art and then learned a little more about them. But you really blessed me with that idea of seeing people as icons and how that, that we are, you know, that is the deeper level of an icon is, is seeing the image of God in each other. That's really beautiful and profound. Don't forget that, I mean, the, the canonical, the, the, the theological discussions in the 6th century, 7th century, 8th century concerning iconography and icons were almost all based on Christ's incarnation. They are not art in the sense of making the church more beautiful. We depict Christ's body because we, we want to make the point that his flesh 
was in no way different from your flesh or my flesh. It was the flesh of a real human being. And if it was a real flesh, then it could be seen, touched and painted. The, the purpose, the theological purpose of painting an icon is that every time you paint an icon, you reaffirm the reality of Christ's incarnation, that God descended and was incarnate in a body as real as my body or yours. Yes, that, I will say, really changed my perspective on icons. And that happened in this last year. Growing up as a Protestant, we had a, a very... Um, how, how would I want to say it? We, we, well, we certainly didn't have them, and there's a lot of iconoclasm in the Protestant tradition. But reading through, say, like John of Damascus and the Seventh of Ecumenical course. Council, yeah. the, the argument from the Incarnation really does seem to be quite strong. Now, I wanted to talk about another kind of pillar, or, and as an outsider, perhaps I have this wrong, but when I look at the Orthodox spiritual tradition, this is something that I see featuring heavily that I don't necessarily see in my own tradition, and that is fasting. Growing up in my church, I'm not sure I could ever tell you a time that fasting was brought up. It simply wasn't something we talked about. But then speaking to some Orthodox people and then uh, just last week, actually, after a divine liturgy, I stayed and talked to a few people for over an hour. They were so kind, just introducing me to some of Orthodoxy. And we're talking about fasting. Could you tell me a bit about why fasting features so prevalently in the Orthodox tradition and what is the goal of it? Well, first of all, before we go into any other explanation, first of all, it features because Christ tells us to do it. Christ himself, while he was alive, he fasted it. He fasted, forgive me. And he did tell us that there are certain passions that we can only heal through prayer and fasting. He did tell us that his disciples, once he is going to be taken away from this life into the kingdom, they will fast themselves. And then if you look at the tradition of the church from the time of Christ up to us today, fasting has never stopped to be uh, one of the pillars of orthodox asceticism in, in, in this church. But that's just to make the point that it's not something that somehow the orthodox have created, invented, and we love it. We don't love it. I mean, you know, food, everybody loves food, let's be honest. It's just something that we do because we are aware that our bodies are so much more than just a tool for... I don't want to say sinfulness because that is obvious, just a tool for survival. If you go back to what I was telling you about icons, that you look at an icon and you see Christ's body there, and it is a reaffirmation of his incarnation, that's one side of the story. The other side of the story is that you see a body, a flesh like yours and mine, that was able to sustain the fullness of divinity. You see, the beauty of an icon is not only that it reaffirms who Christ is, but also it reaffirms who we have the potential to become. That flesh that is depicted on an icon has received in itself God himself. And that flesh that you see depicted is my flesh. So that means that my flesh and your flesh and the flesh of any human being ever created has potentially the ability to contain within itself the fullness of divinity. Now, when you talk about that, when you only even, even contemplate that, that we can become a sort of a, a chalice, if you want, of, of a womb for, for God himself, for, for the divinity to... to to be present in the world, that, that in itself is paralyzing. I mean, I, I'm beginning to start uh, naturally because I'm trying to make sense of something that is beyond our ability to understand. But what I wanted to say is that in an icon, you see the glory, the honor that is available, that is available to our flesh, to our bodies. Fasting and night prayer, night vigil, and everything that is connected to the ascetical tradition of the church, from prostrations and bows and every single, everything else, is completely and entirely linked with this attempt of ours to cleanse our bodies, to make them transparent to the point where through our bodies we can perceive 
that divine image and that our bodies can be cleansed to the point that they themselves can also contain the presence of God. Which is, which is what we believe in, in the Orthodox Church, that while we are still alive, we can contain within ourselves the fullness of God. That's why we eat God's body and we drink his blood in, in the sacraments on a Sunday. So basically for me, the entire question about fasting and asceticism and all of that has to do with whether or not one believes in the fullness of the potential of one's body. Hmm, that's really interesting. And I, I had never thought of it that way. And so you said, you know, the, the goal there is, or the kind of the rationale is that while we're alive, we have the potential of having the fullness of God in us. Could you break that down a little further of what you mean by that? I imagine there's some distinction between the sense in which in Jesus incarnate there is the fullness of God and you know how Chalcedon would define that and how we would or perhaps there's not there is because there is absolutely I mean of course no one else except the person the hypostasis of Christ can be can be both God and man in virtue of their natures that's why Christ's person is both man and God and in him both natures coexist for us we receive the fullness of God, the fullness of God's divinity and his life. Every single attribute of God can become ours by grace, as, as a completely undeserved gift, as, as a gesture of love from Christ. That's, that's where the distinction between grace and nature and that's why the distinction is so important in Orthodox theology. We become God-like, not because we shall ever have the nature of God. The nature of God is inaccessible to us and belongs to God himself. But every attribute of that nature is given to us as a gift. And us in that becoming is who you and I are in our saved versions. Thank you. Last year, I had the privilege of writing on Union with Christ for a term paper. And in so doing, I had to do some historical survey of how this was thought of throughout um, throughout history in the Christian tradition. And going into some of like the patristic writers, there's a lot of talk of theosis, which uh, is prevalent from what I've understood in the Orthodox tradition. Is that essentially what we're getting at here? Is that yes, concept of theosis? Exactly. Yes, that, that, that would be the definition of, of theosis. The way, again, I, as a sinful monk, have made sense of it, and I'm trying to apply it in my, in, in my own life, by God's grace. Mm, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for that. And it was a beautiful description. You mentioned, and you kind of lumped this together, uh, these two ideas together, fasting and asceticism. But for those that aren't familiar... Um, again, growing up as a Protestant, that wouldn't have been a word that would have featured frequently in my vocabulary. It wouldn't have been something we talked about much. As I've looked into church history, it's something I've learned a lot more about. And I imagine as a monk, it's something you're more than a bit familiar with. For those that aren't familiar, could you perhaps just define asceticism and then what uh, that might look like in a monastic life, but then also what that might look like for just a lay person? Well, in, in the Orthodox Church, there's never really been a distinction between the two. There, there aren't certain rules that are applicable or, you know, for monastics and other rules for people who live in the world. And again, the basic um, underlying idea of any ascetical struggle or ascetical work, such as vigil, such as uh, fasting and so on, is that we need to... Let's start from a more kind of basic starting point. In, in, in the world in which we live today, for, for, for reasons that are too complicated to discuss in, in this interview, we've, um, we've somehow mistook the glory, the honor of our bodies for something else. The, the honor of our bodies, the glory of our bodies, 
is to be transparent to the presence of God in them, is to be able to contain the presence of God in you, to become a, a bearer of God. Like, again, imagine yourself as, as, as a chalice made of flesh and bones, and then you walk into the world and you, and you take Christ into the world and other people who may struggle in their faith interact with God through you. Even if they are not aware, their souls are aware because their souls have been created by God and they recognize their creator. Now, unfortunately, instead of giving our bodies that honor, that glory, we are quite ashamed of, of our bodies. And, and uh, that sounds strange to say, particularly in a society and in a culture where you know, going naked in the street doesn't really mean much today. But the reality is that we are ashamed and we are running away. We are hiding the glory of our bodies. Um, I think the best place where you can see that is in the way in which, particularly in the Western society, Western culture, people interact with a, a dead person. If you were to witness a funeral in an Orthodox country, and if you were to witness a funeral, which probably you have, uh, in a Western country and compare the two, then you will see the different ways in which people re react and interact with their, their own flesh. The fact that in, in an Orthodox country that flesh is taken at the very center of the church and exposed to the church, not covered in any way, for three days, that people come and they keep on praying over the body of that person for three days and night. Their neighbors, their friends, their family, and so on, they keep on praying. They are never covered. Everybody kisses the hands or the forehead of the departed. There's, there's no fear. There's no shame. There's no kind of, you know, shying away from that body. Because that body is recognized as, as a potential chalice. That honor and glory of the body is lost in the world, in the West. And the connection there is with asceticism. See, when you want your body to be a chalice for Christ, you have to bring your body to a place where it is able to sustain the presence of God. It cannot just be filled with any food. It cannot be filled with any lustful thoughts. It cannot be... You have to bring your body to a point where it is attuned with the intentions of your soul. Mm -hmm. Christ does say somewhere, you know, I'm Orthodox, I don't, I don't quote by heart gospel. Uh, <clears throat> and also the gospel that I would be able to quote would be in Romanian, not in English. Uh, that... Our, um, our souls are willing, but our bodies are weak. And he does ask his disciples to fast, and he does ask his disciples to keep vigil, to stay awake with him while he is in the garden, and so on. So all these ascetical expressions that you see in, in the Orthodox tradition are simply connected with this awareness that our bodies are so much more than just kind of carriers of our souls. They are part of who we are. There's also in the West uh, this uh, weird perception almost that, okay, we are going to die and then we kind of got rid of our bodies and now we are just pure souls and somehow that's when we are who we are supposed to be. That's not even human, let alone you know, theologically correct, because human beings are souls and bodies at the same time. If, if, you, if you erase, if you lose your bodily aspect, you are no longer a human being. You become a spiritual being, but we are not spiritual beings, we are humans. Our bodies are just as important as our souls in who we are and in our salvation. So why is it that we pay so much attention, theoretically, to our souls, and we have so much uh, disconsideration for our bodies and we pay no attention to them? Hmm. Yes, it seems to almost be that the church has never been free of this Gnostic tendency at lapping at its shores, that, that the body isn't important, that essentially it's only the, the spiritual. One of my favorite Protestant writers, James K. Smith, really introduced me to this, and he critiques what he calls in the West that we think of ourselves as brains on a stick. 
And that yeah, walking brain. I didn't know anybody. Like I thought, th- thank God that you said that. I thought I was the only idiot who kind of sees people that way. We, we, we've become so intellectual in the way in which we relate to, to Christianity and to Christ that it's almost as if we have no, no bodies anymore. Everything has to happen here. It's all about thoughts and emotions. But Christ was not a walking brain, was he? I mean, he so valued our bodies that he became a body. He could eat, he could be hurt, he could feel joy. He, I mean, we know that he loved lilies because he gives them as, you know, the example as the, uh, of the perfect beauty and so on. Uh, there's something very unhealthy in, in, this, in this way in which we, we've reduced our faith to just our emotions and our thoughts. And if I can say something that will sound very harsh, but it's orthodox, so excuse me, it comes from, one, um, a lack of awareness of how glorified our bodies can be, and two, from spiritual laziness. Because it is so much easier to think about the things that you could be. It is so much easier to imagine a spiritual life than to actually do the work. Mm. Yes, I, I appreciate you saying that. I think sometimes we need people to just say it like it is in a time when we can, and I, I know I fall prey to this, be so so worried of saying the wrong thing or you know walking on eggshells, as they say. Um, we, we need people to speak the truth in love in that way. And I think that we in the West and in Protestant traditions uh, really need to reckon with the fact that we have essentially denigrated the role of the body in our spiritual life. And I've heard Protestants kind of critique uh, ascetical practices as kind of Gnostic in that they think that it makes out the body to be bad. But from what I hear you saying, it's actually a glorification of the body and that asceticism's goal is to remind us of the fact that the body is made for so much more than the lowly things we usually give it to. Is that a fair summarization? Yes, absolutely. There is. I can see where the idea that the body is bad can come from, and it is essentially a misunderstanding. Yes, of course, the bodies can become bad in the sense that, again, if you allow your gluttony to take over yourself, then this wonderful tool, this instrument that God has given you to use for your salvation, your body, can turn against itself, against yourself, and become a negative tool, you know, something detrimental to you. If you allow yourself to give in to your lustful thoughts and so on, the same thing will happen. So there is an element of controlling the body, but that's just like the first step on on a beautiful ladder that actually should lead to the glorification of our bodies. We are not we are not ascetical in order to destroy our bodies, but simply because we want our bodies to reach their fullness, their full potential, to to, to become what God created them to be. Wow, that's that's so helpful for me, and I think so well said. I have gotten so much out of this, and I just want to say thank you so much. This is definitely one that I'm going to go back and rewatch. As we begin to kind of bring it to a close, I want to ask uh, two things. First, I want to ask, um, you've given so much spiritual wisdom in this, and I'm sure people are just, they they're probably feel as though they're drinking from a fire hydrant with, with so much here. But if you could give, if someone was coming to you, and I imagine, you know, perhaps this needs to be contextualized for different people, but in your experience, um, if someone wants to grow in their spiritual life, if they're just saying, I, I feel like I'm, I'm stagnant in this, or I feel like um, I, I just want to go deeper, I, I want to come to know God more, what what would be the first piece of advice you would give them? Honesty. You have to be extremely, painfully honest about who you are when you bring yourself before God. And always start to build yourself up from from the base. And the base of who you are and who all of us are is that nothingness out of which God created us. If you go back and you look at at the ways in which you, you, you fail, if you look back at your sinfulness, if you look back at just the basic things and you uh, not judge yourself, but kind of assess yourself honestly every single time, 
when you bring yourself before God in prayer, then necessarily you are going to, to grow. Necessarily. It's, it's unavoidable. It's just that you have to keep in mind that spiritual growth does not look like growth into this world. Spiritual growth can be, can look like failure to this world. Mm. I mean, I, I, I'm aware that particularly for the West, this may be a difficult thing to understand because success in the world and success in one's spiritual life have become so kind of attuned to each other. They all, we almost kind of see them together mm. all the time. But in the East, that has never been the case. Don't forget that our, our ideal is a naked man on a cross being mm. killed by his own nation for whom he came in order to save them. That, in worldly um, words, is the biggest loser of everyone. But in spiritual terms, that is God himself. Amen. I think in the mega church Western Protestant upbringing that I, I found myself in, if we ran the same criteria that we gave for pastors, church planters, and churches, um, if we applied that to Jesus, he wouldn't be getting hired anywhere. And I think that is such a dangerous position to be in. So thank you so much for that. There is so much for people to go back through with this and do that honest self-reflection with. And I know I will be doing that. And I thank you so much for just the blessing that this has been to have this conversation. I want to end it by letting thank you talk you. a little bit. Thank yes, you, my... first of all, uh, for allowing me. I need to say this. Thank you for allowing me mm -hmm. to meet you in a real sort of way. It has been absolutely my pleasure. And thank you so much for doing this. I want to allow you to tell a bit of the story in whatever way you'd like of Mall Monastery, because from what I've read, the work you guys are doing there is something really special. And I also know from watching your videos that it is supported by people from all over the world. And so I would not want you to miss this opportunity to just let some people know about the work that's going on there and that how they can learn more about it and perhaps also the other things you're doing like your YouTube channel and your podcast. I genuinely would prefer not to talk about supporting the monastery because I want people to see that what I've said I've shared with an honest heart and I don't want you know any sort of uh, shade to come over that. The monastery exists. It is built on the Isle of Mull in the Hebrides. The Hebrides are um, a group of islands to the northwest of Scotland where in the first millennium, the 500s, 600s, 700s and so on, there were hundreds of monasteries and skits and hermits, male and female, living in the hundreds of little islands that exist here. All of that, all of that existed as part of this uh, one Christian church that existed in the first millennium. That's why they are so special, the, these saints, to the Orthodox Church, the Catholic Church, and all Christians everywhere, because they are part of the common trunk, if you want to put it that way. Now, because of the Viking attacks uh, at the end of the first millennium, they were either martyred, they were basically butchered, or they managed to run away. And monasticism has never uh, caught root here again, in great part because of the effects of uh, the Reformation and everything that followed after that. It's just, you know, the way it is historically. And uh, in 2010... I found out about an abandoned church on the Isle of Mull, and um, we accepted it as a gift. I say we, but it was just me at the time. And I was hoping that I would just live by myself alone as a hermit in, in this church. But God has blessed something else, something that had you know, no place in my heart at the time. And uh, slowly we grew, and now there is a small monastery here. There are six of us living on the island. And... Um, it, it, is, it is, if I am to be honest, rather fearful to think that we celebrate in a place where we know that the first Christian presence was St. Ninian, and St. Ninian lived in the 300s. 
So it, it is rather frightening to know that underneath our feet there are monastics and Christians buried for at least 17 centuries. Wow, that sounds like wonderful work that you all are doing there. And I appreciate you sharing some of that story. I will be sure to leave a link in the description to uh, your website for the monastery, as well as just to your YouTube channel, because I'm sure, and I know you might uh, be bashful about sending people your way, but I'm sure so many people having listened to this will want to hear more from you. And I know I've benefited from your video, so I would love to share that with them as well. But Father Seraphim, thank you so much for doing this and God bless. God bless. Thank you, Austin. Thank you so very much.